10 years from now, when this is like a whole thing, people will ask like, yeah, why the hell did they pick first touch instead of last touch? <laughs> and it's like, well, let me tell you, we spent a couple hours at the whiteboard and we just decided and that's it. And that's the one that took off. That's, that's how it happened. And like, you can't have that moment in Web2 anymore. Like it just doesn't exist. So. Hey everybody, Tanner here with Wagner Ventures. On today's episode, we have Antonio Garcia Martinez, founder and CEO of Spindle. For anyone who's new, this is the Wagme Ventures podcast, where we do snapshots with interesting founders from across Web3. Check out wagmeventures.io to learn more about the syndicate behind the podcast. But for now, let's get into it with Antonio at Spindle. All right. Hey, everybody. I'm here today with Antonio Garcia Martinez, founder and CEO of Spindle. Antonio, how are you doing today? I am very jet lagged. I just got back from Israel yesterday, so I, I don't know what time it is. <laughs> I hear you. I'm personally super pumped to chat. People who know me know this is a serious highlight for me to get to have you on the show. So super pumped to talk. And if it's cool with you, I, I actually want to divide our time together in three parts today, which is really just kind of first, some questions about Spindle. And then second, some questions about just kind of crypto as a space. And then last, maybe just a couple questions if we have time uh, that I have for you as just kind of a longtime fan and follower of your work. So yeah. does that work for you? Let's ship it. Love it. So before we dive into all of that, maybe just for anyone who's not familiar with your work, could you just give us a quick kind of background, uh, tough as that may be, <laughs> you've done a lot, but maybe just a quick background and uh, what brought you to creating Spindle? Yeah, there's a there's a fair amount of professional ADD going on here. So yeah, I guess the the shorter version is dropped out of a PhD, went to work on Wall Street just at the on the wrong time to watch the credit crisis happen, and I had one of the a good intuition that tech would somehow survive the mayhem. So I went west and landed back in San Francisco and started working at an ad tech startup, which is where this whole ad where I, I've spent most of my career. So I had a YC startup that I sold to Twitter. I was early Facebook, an advisor at Twitter, worked at Branch Metrics, an attribution company, briefly at Apple, et cetera, et cetera. Basically building a lot of stuff on the sort of ad tech data attribution analytics sort of world on the Web2 side. And then somewhere along the lines, most recently, I got crypto pilled by a bunch of friends in crypto. They made some introductions and I just could not understand why people didn't know their LTVs or their CACs or their retentions or where users came from or any of the sort of standard growth metrics and, and attribution and analytics that you have in Web2. And so I, we set out to, to fix that problem, which, is, which brings us to Spindle, um, which is Web3's kind of first real attribution platform now now with added analytic sauce and also referrals program and a bunch of other stuff but that's uh yeah that's my background Love oh it. and i yeah. i forgot to mention uh, yeah there's there's been a little forays in there into media and writing I, I wrote a memoir of my time at facebook called chaos monkeys that some people may have heard about it made a bit of a splash in 2016 and yeah also later as well and i you know wrote for wired magazine and vanity fair and washington post and a bunch of other things i spent time in the wilderness as a as a journalist although i usually say it in hush tones because it's <laughs> not not a great thing to say these days funny yeah no that's awesome okay so spindle is the name of the company uh you know, one thing that I think might help ground folks and kind of anchor the conversation is just really a perspective that I think you'd have an interesting perspective on what are the second order effects if attribution is made possible by Spindle and becomes more widely adopted in Web3? Because it's it's really not a thing in Web3, right? So like what becomes possible for the space when attribution is possible? Yeah, so let's define the term because it sounds a little wonky and very serious. And, and I think it's often hard. Even people in Web2 often get it wrong. So what attribution means, right, as the name sort of implies is, well, who, who do I attribute for a thing that happened? What that means is a user comes in, right, and either downloads your app or signs up or gets on chain and does a thing. They monetize to the tune of some amount or they do certain things in your app. Who do I kind of credit or blame for this user? Who do I say, okay, thank you, Twitter, or thank you, Google, or, or thank you, social media team. You sent me a user whose lifetime value on average, whatever, $437, right? Which is way above the customer acquisition cost of, uh, you know, whatever, $100, $200. And so I have a greater than 2x ROAS or return on advertising spend. So I'm a happy marketer, right? It's, it's this business of basically measuring the value of the user, comparing it to how much it drove to drive this user and correctly crediting who brought the user. And you might be asking, well, okay, I can see how that would sort of be useful. What, why is it why is it as critical as it is in Web2, which it is? Um, the reason why is that it's an input to a business model, right? On the Web2 side, if you go and buy an ad or Facebook, gone are the days of paying for a thousand ad impressions flashing some website. What you typically pay for is actually the sort of, you know, the downstream or bottom of funnel, to use the wonky marketing term, 
action that you care about, which is the user like installing the app or the user signing up for a subscription or a user doing whatever, right? Attribution matters in a world in which advertisers pay for certain events or certain things happening in the middle of the funnel. Without it, you wouldn't know who to pay, right? Like in theory, right? Here's where I, I get slightly cynical. In theory, what the attribution system tells you is how did this user get here? In, in actuality, what it tells you is, who do I pay for? <laughs> do I pay for Google or Facebook uh, in this case, in the case of Web2? So in the Web3 world, and I, I, I'm guessing your follow-up question will be in this direction, it, it gets a little more complicated. Because, of course, it, it's not just, fortunately, it's not a Facebook, Google sort of marketing world. But you still have to think about, okay, did this user come in through an influencer posting in the Discord, uh, crypto Twitter doing a thing, me buying an ad, me doing an NFT or a token drop, like what? How did this user get here and why? And is the, are the means that I use to draw in the user kind of scalable and good? At a high level, attribution applies in Web3 as, as much as it does in Web2. The technical details though, tend to differ by quite a bit. Yeah, you definitely intuited part of my next question, which is, <laughs> it's kind of a recurring question, actually, that pops up on this podcast a lot, which is, you know, really just trying to get a sense for like those earliest decisions that often kind of matter most in the life of a startup, like Earliest challenges. Uh, my question was going to be, what one of the one or two earliest challenges that have come with building Spindle, and how did you and your team solve for those? And specifically in context of what you just said, I I have to imagine just the balkanization of you know Web three is one of those challenges, right? Just technically, despite you know ostensibly it being, I guess from one perspective, could be seen as an easier problem because everything is not siloed; it's all on chain. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. No, I mean that's an excellent point. I mean part of Part of how we got to the spindle idea, right, was me thinking, I mean, I, I used to work for a company called Branch, which was one of the biggest sort of independent attribution platforms that probably nobody's heard of it. But whether you realize it or not, a lot of your online data is living inside Branch or Apps Flyer or Just, and there's other ones, of course, uh, but, but there's a few big ones. Or, you know, Facebook has its own sort of verticalized attribution platform. How does your data get in? Well, how it typically works is events are being fired from the device side. Like when you're using your little mobile app and you... You go and you convert and you buy the thing on Airbnb, call the Uber ride or whatever. There's literally a like conversion event, conversion with religious overtones, of course, being fired to the attribution system saying user XYZ converted to the tune of whatever, one, two, three dollars, right? That's how it typically works. And believe it or not, like basically what these Web2 attribution systems are, are these massive event ingestion engines in which they just sit there and they, they're they basically eating this fire hose of hundreds of thousands of events being fired per second, billions a day um, that's, that have these events and they just ingest them. And, I, you know, I'd be inside this machine and think like, well, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be better for everyone to just write to the same database, <laughs> right? Rather than right. basically rep replicating data left and right. And that like much of the game of, of Web2 is, is really just replicating state across dozens of different interlinked tools. Web3, as, as you're hinting at, actually makes it easier in some ways in the sense that not all the data you care about, right? There's many things that you want to track or care about that are off-chain, but at least when it comes to true Web3 native applications like DeFi, for example, you know, all the value transfer and all the events that are important are happening on-chain by definition, right? I mean, by its very nature, DeFi, you know, doesn't just take your credit card numbers and <laughs> and do a fee, unless it's an on-ramp, maybe they do. But, <laughs> but typically right. speaking, that's, that's kind of not it. And so it, it does make it easier in a sense. Um, that ease is deceptive though. It's It's easier in the sense that yeah, to ingest that data, there is no integration cost. Like you don't need to be running like code on the device to actually in ingest those records. But the burden is kind of on Spindle, right? To to take, you know, the protocol or the DAP or whatever it is, look at the smart contracts, figure out how does value flow through this business, right? If it's a DeFi protocol, how is revenue generated from whatever, these synthetic options or, or whatever it is, or the currency swap, or if it's a game, how does the gameplay match to things happening on chain, the NFT sale or whatever it is, right? And you turn that into the metrics that the that the developer or the marketer cares about, right? Which is, you know, pretty basic numbers like rev. And again, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. In fact, in some of our clients, literally the first time they looked at their true revenue was when they looked at their spindle dashboard and we calculated for them and we saw, oh, this is the, you know, this is the options premium that your options protocol is generating minus the actual like LP staking rewards that are backing up your, your little market here and that are varying with every trade, right? Like they didn't even have a dashboard that showed them that, much less split out by inbound channel or any of that stuff. And so, yeah, the blockchain makes it easier in a way, but on the other hand, when it comes to us, the onus is kind of more, you know, more interesting and, 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 and more complex, which is what we always suspected. Like our fundamental spindle thesis is that marketing and attribution and all these Web2 concepts, if you port them and rebuild them in a properly Web3 way, 
are going to actually be a lot more interesting and complex and sophisticated and actually powerful in Web3 than they were in Web2. I know we look at that huge Web2 machine that generates billions of dollars of revenue and supports literally trillion dollar companies, but I think Web3 has legitimately the ability to do it a lot better and a lot more interesting than Web2. Yeah, fascinating. Okay, so this is kind of more of a, I guess, company building question where I, I think I saw at one point you'd hired away Polygon's head of partnerships. And <laughs> so, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't characterize it that way. He he he, okay. he, he approached us first. But, nice. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. So I guess my question is really, you know, are there any lessons you'd want to impart from working together that might be generalizably helpful for the entire ecosystem, kind of specifically around communicating crypto's value to non-crypto native potential partners. Like, I feel like that's something that, you know, you guys may be developing an aptitude for. Um, Uh, I think so. I mean, to be honest, like our biggest communication or like, you know, proselytize your gospel challenge is more about sort of proselytizing the value of marketing to Web3 natives, right? Because yeah. they, they, they sort of get it, right? Like everyone's got like a Dune dashboard, which at the end of the day is our real competition, right? It's like, you know, the, the joke used to be that in SaaS startups, the real competition is not any other company. It's some Excel spreadsheet inside that company, right? <laughs> that was always oh, yeah. the joke. And <laughs> in Web3 marketing, it, it's the same except, and, and we love Dune to be clear. We're, we're actually, you know, we're, it's one of our data sources. We're paying users of it. And the CEO has been very helpful to us in the past, but our competition in some sense is some Dune dashboard sitting inside the company that, kind of does an okay job at, right? Enough that they have the warm fuzzies that they're keeping on top of their business, even though, you know, often it's not quite enough. Um, so yeah, just how do you convey that? And then I think the other thing is, I mean, certainly when we've sought out partnerships, we've been a partnership now with an Israeli company, which is why I was in Israel called Addressable. We've also partnered with the marketing agencies. We're talking about doing other deals. Like if you come from that web two world, you understand that no one company is going to dominate this world. And in fact, you're going to have a bunch of sort of inner interlocking technologies that work together to build what is the sort of growth machinery and the flywheel that drives, you know, monetization in that world. And so, you know, we, we often pitch like partnerships with companies that people often think are competitive or something, but in fact are complementary to us. And we're very happy to work in that mode. And again, try to build what we think is going to be a very complex sort of ecosystem, but, you know, trying to make that case is often a little hard. Like people don't, if you don't come from the Web2 world, you don't understand that things like attribution, analytics, ads targeting, segmentation, CRM, these are all kind of separate functions, right? And they're going to have to sort of interoperate in interesting ways. And it's not even clear where those lines like start and end necessarily, but it it needs to exist. So just, you know, proselytizing that message, like let's build a a growth ecosystem is one of the challenges. Yeah, super interesting. So you know, this is actually a question I really have that's related to what you just said, where, you know, I listened to you on the Bankless podcast. And as a listener, it seemed a little bit like they positioned you as like, you know, former big tech guy doing this one weird trick called attribution <laughs> that true crypto native DGENs may find like offensive on, on, I don't know, like an ideological level or something. And I don't know if you felt that way at all. I could totally be misreading this. But my question was really, it, it sounds a little bit based on what you said that they were maybe speaking to a felt reality more so than I would have thought. The gospel message of, hey, marketing is actually good. You need to think about this stuff well, think about it in a structured way. All this stuff is important. It sounds like they had their finger on something there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we've definitely gotten a little bit of pushback or questions around like, oh, what are you doing with data? Um, And we're quite open about this. Like you can go to our blog and see our takes on most things. We're very open about what we do with data which, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant. I think I actually quote that in the, in the blog post. So occasionally there's a little bit of pushback there because, you know, one of the things you have to do, right? Like, again, like, wh- what are we really building? Like, you click on a thing in Web 2, right? And Web 2 is never going away. We're going to have clicks and page views and all that basic web stuff forever, right? It's never going away, right. even if it's talking to a blockchain. You click on a thing, and a week later, you actually do a thing on chain, right? You swap the currency, you buy the NFT, whatever. We tile it. Together. Well, how can you do that without maintaining some stable notion of identity between Web 2 and Web 3, which we do. And again, we're very, we're very open about it. It's completely anonymous. Um, we have various versions of how this worked in the most privacy forward way. Um, it kind of works like post hog or plausible if you're familiar with those tools. These are like basically Google Analytics, but with more privacy sauce, right? And, and less persistent identity, which, you know, which we also do. And again, the goal isn't really to track people and certainly not sell the data or do anything with it. It's really just to understand if, if you got to a protocol to adapt and you clicked on a Telegram post and you clicked on a tweet, just figuring out, okay, who gets credit for this, right? Who was the last yep. person to touch you before you got to the thing? And the reality is if you want to reward the right crypto influencer or this podcast or the bankless guys, like if you want to do right by what is, you know, the crypto media ecosystem, 
you need to do this, right? You can't like, it, it's actually worse for the world <laughs> if you don't actually have correct attribution because guess who gets all the credit? Google say it does or whatever. Totally. Like you, just, you reward the wrong person. Like you don't actually lead to a better world if you don't have some notion of like who actually drove this out. And again, there's, there's various ways to build that. And, you know, I think we've built it in the most privacy safe and kind of delicate manner possible. But I think it is changing a little bit, right? As the bear market sort of drags on and as companies realize, you know, I, I actually need to have a real business here, right? When, you know, when token and token go up are just not going to be, you know, sustainable business models. And yeah. so I think people there get, get, get very reasonable when, you know, their, their businesses are struggling to grow, then, you know, people get off their, their soapboxes. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Super interesting. Okay. So, you know, maybe transitioning to some kind of broader crypto space questions here. And I wanted to start just by asking, you know, I think it was last year sometime, you had a, an epic thread on Twitter about Web3 being the frontier in a way that Web2 just kind of isn't anymore for like folks in tech. And I think what I wanted to ask is, can you talk a little bit about some of the thinking behind that thread, some yeah, of what yeah. you were seeing and experiencing and what motivated you to put words to, I think what a lot of people felt where crypto is sort of this new frontier for tech people specifically. Oh yeah, I remember that thread. I think, I think it probably pissed some people off. <laughs> a lot of my friends do. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, it's weird because I'm like, I'm like the, the, not literal boomer, but you know, what one generation beyond most people in crypto, at least one generation beyond what people in crypto in which like I'm sitting right now in Soma, um, which is like the start of you part of San Francisco across from the blue bottle right next to South Park where Twitter was invented and close to the offices of like every Web2 consumer company that you've raised. And back in those days, my, my, my last sort of really truly zero to one startup was in 2010 or 11 or so. So like just over 10 years ago now. And, you know, there was this feeling of being like on the wild west and the frontier of something crazy, right? Like Uber was just starting up, right? Airbnb was struggling. And again, after the fact, these all seem like foregone conclusions, but I'm here to tell you that like, I heard the first Uber pitch and it sounded right <laughs> because it was like <laughs> this black car service that only worked in two cities. There was no Uber X thing where you could just sign up to be a driver or any of that stuff, right? Sure. Airbnb had didn't have monthly offerings. It was typically literally an air mattress on somebody's living room, which wasn't that attractive. And who the hell is going to let a stranger into their room? And I remember when I joined Facebook, I was one of the first product managers on the ad system in 2010. And like the ad system sucked, right? And the CPMs were terrible. <laughs> and it was like everyone, everyone thinks that all these things like, oh, yeah, it was obvious the internet was going to be a big deal. Like, no, it wasn't, right? Like just like we have doubts now about Web3, there's all sorts of doubts about it. Right. It's, and some of those models did not take off. A lot of companies failed, but some of them did succeed. But again, there was this feeling of like tremendous momentum and enthusiasm. You can just make things up as you went along and make models up, right? And the reality is that like, look, you can't really do that in Web2 anymore, right? There's, I, you know, the, act, the, the letters always change. I mean, that, it's not Fang anymore because Microsoft is in there, but whatever. You've got the, the, the half dozen or so massive incumbents that dominate the space and fight amongst themselves. And then you've got other companies that dominate certain niches. And it's not... Like, to be blunt, I don't know that the smartest grads or the most ambitious grads are going to get a job at, this, at these companies now. Like, they're simply not, right? Even though their founders may not realize it, <laughs> but they're not. And I think Web3 feels more exciting in that way. I mean, it's, Web3 is different in fundament, foundational ways, by the way. I don't think this is just a, a redo of history. But it, it is the case that it just feels like, like right now, so take Spindle as, as, as an example, right? Like what, what attribution model do we use? Do we do last touch for like the last touch guy get, takes the credit? Is it first touch? Is it a multi-touch thing? Can we bake it into the referral model such that everyone gets paid a little bit if the user makes it? Like there's all these things that have to be defined that some, you know, some startup that raised a seed round with sub 10 employees is more or less like establishing an industry standard, right? Like yeah. we'll see if, this, if we be, we if we become the industry standard in attribution whether we hope we will. But if we do, like the random model we're shipping now will will become that standard. And ten years from now, when this is like a whole thing, people will ask like, yeah, why the hell did they pick first touch instead of last touch? <laughs> it's right. like, well, right. right. let me tell you, we spent a couple hours <laughs> at the whiteboard and we just decided, and that's it, and that's the one that's totally. enough. That's that's how it happened. And like, you can't have that moment in Web two anymore. Like, it just doesn't exist. Yeah, fascinating. Love it. You chronicled your Web2 experience in, in such great detail in Chaos Monkeys, which I love, by the way. I know a lot of people did. And so I'm curious, what's been different about launching a startup in Web3 compared to when you were founder in Web2, you know, going through YC, all of kind of that era that you were basically just describing? Yeah, so Chaos Monkeys, again, it was this sort of insider memoir that like it's... <laughs> it's gotten a lot of attention and I often joke, it's easy to be superlative when you have no competition, right? Because there weren't that, there weren't that many like actually readable insider books about that wave of, of web technology. So I, I set out to sort of try to document it. And not that my career was particularly stellar, but I think it was 
very emblematic of a lot of things at the time, right? I was like a, a, a tech bro every man, I guess, which is what the core of the book is. So what, what's, what's different from that? Well, a lot of things, right? A lot of the numbers in terms of valuations and money raised are just like 10x higher now than they used to be. Like, it's amazing that we consider this to be a bear market, but the rounds are still over 10x where they were in what was then a massive boom, right? Like I went through YC in like 2010. We were like a middle of the pack company. Our cap on our safe note, actually, there weren't even safe notes yet, but the thing that became a safe note, we raised that at a valuation of $3 million, which would be considered a joke now. Like, you know, Spindle's valuation is like 10x that out of, out of the, you know, r- right off the bat and with like a lot less progress than, than my little company did it had at the time, right? So the numbers are just bigger. That I was I was literally just talking about this with my CTO. We're going over expenses. There's just a lot more business infrastructure to use. You've got ramp cards. You've got Gusto for payroll. You've got background checks. You've got Pilot for accounting. I'm just running down the list of our stack, right? There's there's other options in those stacks, but it's just so much. E- like back in the day, you had like a payroll thing like ADB, a- ADP or something, and you had to physically go to Bank of America to get a single right, credit. Right. Like, like it was just. <laughs> It was just complete. And then obviously on, on the tech side, right, there's just so much more technical infrastructure now than there used to be, you know, Docker, containerization, cloud, like just on and on. It's, I wouldn't say it's easier per se. I mean, some things are easier to do now, but whenever you build the ability to to do things simply, you just increase complexity typically along another dimension. So I, I think the time it takes to ship a serious product hasn't changed too, too much, although you're not spending too much time working on the basics anymore. Um, but yeah, things... Things are a little different. I mean, I, I think also the other thing is that people are kind of smarter now, right? Like there's a vast literature. I mean, some of it is like self-serving and not great, but there's a vast literature yeah. of just how do you run a startup? What do you do? And at the time there was like, you know, two or three dozen Paul Graham essays. And like, that was it. <laughs> that totally, was the play. Totally, like, there totally. was nothing else. <laughs> now there's entire books you can buy that at least keep you from doing totally dumb stuff. And I think it's also a little bit more acceptable to do a startup. Like there's a whole, there's a whole, you know, ambitious kid to, to start a pipeline. At the time it was a little, a little odd and not that typical to do. Yeah, I love it. Okay, so maybe one last question here on crypto. Question is actually another recurring one. If I say the future of crypto is blank, how do you fill in the blank? And a little mysterious and dicey, I would say, from being very objective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, the, the reason why I found crypto interesting, other, I mean, other parts of it come off to me like a religious cult, right? And, and I think, you know, a, a little bit of the, the sheen of that cult is wearing, right? Like, decentralize all the things is clearly not the way forward, right? Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I think, quote unquote, Web3, which I, I, I agree is not like the best term, but for lack of a better one, I, we're, we're going to go with it is cool is that it kind of naturally unseats a lot of the incumbents, right? And like, we can finally just stop talking about Facebook and Twitter and Google and Microsoft (laughs) and the same four or five companies, right? As much as I worked with some of these companies and like them, I think it's time for the tech world to kind of move on and not be nominated by the same name. And I I think if if crypto accomplishes nothing, if at the end of the day, users are are doing cool shit online, quote unquote, on chain, they, they may not even know they're on a blockchain, right? Like it all just seamlessly works. They're not custodying wallets or any of that stuff. Even if all it accomplishes is moving the basic consumer internet stack off of four or five companies to a few other companies, like I will already have considered it. <laughs> even if the, <laughs> even if the consumer internet ten years from now, in terms of like the user experience, doesn't look terribly different than it does now, I and I I will still consider that a success because it, it means that in some sense we've we've slashed and burned the existing you know the existing tech ecosystem and hopefully created something a little bit more interesting. Although, although I do, I do agree to be clear with the principles of decentralization and sort of a very intentional fragmentation, I think are good. Um, and so I, I think moving that direction is, all, is also a good thing. Yeah. Love it. Okay. So a couple of questions here that are a little more AGM focused where yeah. first one that came to mind was, you know, and it, obviously in addition to being a founder, we've talked about how you're an excellent prolific writer across publications like Wired, Tablet, you got a Substack called The Pull Request, tons of other places in addition to your book. And, you know, several of your pieces have made a big impression on me as a reader. Some recent ones were uh, the Die for the Dow piece, reviewing Balaji's network state, and you wrote a Texas piece for Wired. Uh, you wrote a piece about your conversion to Judaism and Tablet that I really liked. And so, you know, I've, I've followed your writing for a long time. And I, I think the main question I had for you was, I'm curious which piece of writing you most enjoyed working on that really left like the biggest impression on you for having written it. Oh, yeah, interesting question. You've clearly uh, done your homework here, even down to the uh, the tablet uh, Judaism piece, which has gotten incredible traction, by the way. Nice, um, yeah, I believe it. It's it's weird because it's kind of a niche thing, but which was the most interesting? I mean, the, you know, Chaos Monkeys was, you know, semi-autobiographical. I tried to keep the focus not on me, 
because like I'm not that interesting. But you know, my editor pushed it to, for me to like ham it up a little bit and make it as Hunter S. Thompsony as possible. And so I, I will say, if anyone reads the book, I'm you know a little nicer in person than uh, the impression I give off in that book. <laughs> Although you know the the book was. Definitely, I think, true to the spirit of the times, right? And people in that world. So yeah, I'm obviously Chaos Monkeys reviewing what was to me a very formative experience working at Facebook when I, you know, I was somebody who had basically chanced into this inside look at this titanic generation defining company, right? And so to me, like I spent two weeks, for example, going through all the emails and messages reconstructing history, because, you know, I, I did try to do the historian's task, like the dates in the book are accurate and the events are more or less as accurate as any memoir could be. It's not just based on memory. So like going through literally years of your life and trying to establish a narrative about it has a certain introspective quality to it. So that, that was definitely an impactful thing. Um, other pieces of writing, I don't know, not all of it has impacted me personally that much. I guess I did do a piece on the internet in Cuba in 2017. So my parents who are Cuban exiles who fled the island after, after communism, they came as children. I was raised in Miami, which is kind of a reboot of, of Cuban society before communism, but in, in Miami of all places. And so I going, going people, by the way, people in that exile sort of world rarely go back, right? Because it's obviously it's a dictatorial police state. They, they came to the United States to get away from it. There's, you know, the country's a ruin. There's no particular reason to go back unless you have family there. So by and large, people like me don't go to all people in Miami. But I, I, decided, I chose to go back because I wanted to kind of highlight what a you know, kind of what a society is like with no internet, right? And I, I won't go into a long story of how it works. It's one of the, it, it came out in 2017. If, if you look for my name and in Cuban internet, you'll find it. But just, you know, and also it was personally interesting because I'd never been basically living in a dictatorship, which which Cuba still very much is. Yeah. And it's it's amazing to go, I was reporting illegally, by the way, because of course, good luck getting a journalist visa. Journalism is more or less officially illegal in, in Cuba. So I had to go as a tourist and I would, kind of invent these stories about, oh, well, you know, I'm kind of writing a thing. Like the book had already come out. People knew that I was a writer. <laughs> and of course, they saw through the lie, of course. Sure. And, um, you know, the weird thing about a dictatorship, people live in a in a network of lies, right? Like, re like truth, capital T truth, doesn't really exist like at all, right? And so you're telling one set of stories like your family, another one to another friend, and another to a stranger that you don't totally trust. And um, everyone lives in this sort of weird register of lies. And I think it's a very common phenomenon. If you read you know, Milos's The Captive Mind, a very famous account of what it was like Iron Curtain, or even Solzhenitsyn uh, being an extreme example, you get the same feeling of what it's like to live under the thumb of a police state, right? And so like actually being in Cuba and living in a police state, and it was odd because again, I was reporting illegally. People warned me, by the way, people are like, we know what you're doing. And at some point, you're going to go asking too many questions and the police are going to show up and hassle you and or maybe like deport you. And so just FYI. <laughs> and so, you know, after I spent whatever it was, two or three weeks there, I'm like, okay, I, I still want to get the hell out of here. I think Cuba was terrible, by the way. I mean, I, I thought it, I, would do, I don't encourage people to go, <laughs> um, but I couldn't wait to get out. And the moment the plane landed in Miami, it was like this sigh of relief, like God bless America and the constitution and the bill of rights and everything else that makes up Western liberalism. Because <laughs> let me tell you, everyone might, you know, you might shit on it and or not love it because you're there and you're kind of being whiny about it. They go spend some time completely outside of that world and you will you too will miss it so yeah that was very much an impactful writing experience love it yeah okay so two last questions here antonio first question yeah. in startups you know there's always this need to overcome obstacles create things from scratch and so my question is which has required more from you living in a yurt on orcas island <laughs> or the turbulent high seas of web3 yeah i mean <clears throat> Um, I think they're not totally unrelated, right? This this your thing, in case you're wondering what the hell what the hell is Tanner talking about. <laughs> um, so after the book came out, I, I actually wrote the book in a little cabin in a, in a place called the San Juan Islands, which is these beautiful set of islands that nobody should ever visit because I want it to remain unspoiled, please. But it's um, nor northwest of Seattle, and I actually wrote the book there on one of the islands. And then when one of the advance checks hit, it checks hit on like a whim, I bought like five wooded acres on there with nothing on it, right? Like it's still. A lot of the land is still undeveloped. And so after the book came out and like a bunch of TV, media, a month on the bestseller, it's all, you know, yada, yada, yada. I just showed up with a backpack to this piece of land and decided to make it my own and dug a well and chopped down trees and solar panels and built a yurt and this whole business. And so it was very much on your own, you know, man against nature, although obviously with lots of tools and some help uh, sort of experience. So, yeah, no, it's somewhat analogous to the startup thing. I think, I mean, obviously it calls on, on different sets of skills, right? Like I, like I was actually pretty handy with a splitting mall and axes and like, you know, a chainsaw <laughs> from being an amateur lumberjack trying to maintain these, these acres <laughs> of woods, which obviously, unfortunately do not come in handy when I'm on like Slack threads and mails right, and podcasts. Right, right. You're um, the N of one with that like Venn diagram of skills. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
I, you know, I don't know. I mean, you, you'll find true startup weirdos who go off and sail or, or spend time in the woods or something. But um, yeah, it's different skills. But, you know, it's all in the service of a vision, right, of a, a sort of intangible reality that you're trying to build. And you go off in a very foolhardy way and you go off and try to build it. Maybe it works out and maybe it doesn't. There definitely has to be a spirit of adventure to it, I think, and wanting to live kind of at the edge and seeing what happens um, in both cases. Love it. Okay, Antonio, uh, what's your team working on right now? And what's the best way for people to follow along in the journey? Yeah. So, you know, our vision has remained kind of the same, which is how, how do you build attribution in Web3? And, I, you know, we've largely solved that problem. Like, where do users come from? How do they monetize? How long do they stick around? Like, that's like a solved problem now. But we are thinking about expanding in other other directions. Um, we have like a, a referral and reward system. So you can actually, you know, pay people who drive users that actually monetize well. It's a very native form of Web3 marketing that we support. Um, we're thinking about more interesting ways of doing analytics, right? Like, like somebody does something on chain. They come to do something on your website, and then they come on chain again. Like, how, how do you actually join all these various touch points in some way that makes sense? So that, that's kind of the next stage. We've kind of moved on to the, we solved the basic attribution problem, and now we've kind of moved on to all the other technologies that, have to, that exist alongside it. Um, if that's interesting to anybody, if you want to use Spindle or, or talk about attribution, then we can talk about it for hours. Uh, yeah, the best way to reach out, I'm at Antonio GM on, on Twitter, or we have... God, I always forget. It's either spindle underscore XYZ or spindle XYZ. We're easier to find on Twitter, but um, hit up either one. Perfect. Antonio, thank you so much for the time. Serious gift to get to chat and appreciate the generosity with your answers. So have a great rest of your week here and take care. Thanks, Tanner. Bye-bye.